A senior editor Surya Gangadharan also on the program. Surya, good morning to you. This is an important day for India and Japan as we strengthen our ties. Uh, here's another, in fact, laying foundation of that most promising uh, launch of that bullet train today. Well, absolutely. In terms of perception, in terms of uh, the uh, direction India wants to go, I think the high-speed rail, the bullet train, as others call it, is a um, uh, great uh, um, goal, a great aim to achieve uh, in terms of technologies, in terms of the training, it will uh, impart to Indian personnel, engineers, and in terms of the huge infrastructure that we will get uh, from the uh, railway's current uh, rather uh, <coughs> flagging levels of uh, infrastructure. So it's a big move forward. Um, the uh, only point is this thing will take time. It involves a lot of money, but uh, it's, uh, it's transformative in terms of uh, what it will achieve for India's uh, railway network. And as, uh, in fact, the railway minister is talking, he also mentioned that this is a symbol of friendship between the two nations. And since uh, the ties between India and Japan have been uh, getting stronger over the years, uh, how do you see the new strategic and uh, other defense cooperation partnerships coming forward? Well, I think uh, the strategic uh, relationship is being driven by outside factors. Uh, the fact that uh, Japan and India have... Uh, uh, common issues with China, which are territorial in nature, and uh, also because China is uh, pushing forward its own uh, uh, concept of territoriality, uh, claiming vast areas of the South China Sea, uh, laying claim to parts of uh, island, la island links in Japan. Uh, these are issues that we are facing on our own land border with uh, China. And uh, as you're aware, there was a uh, standoff in Doklam uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Japan was the only country to step forward and publicly support India on that score. So uh, it, it tells you that uh, Mr. Abe being present here is a huge signal being sent out to China and to all those nations that are uh, inimical to um, either country. So in that sense, the strategic ties between India and Japan are going to see a huge uh, move forward. Yes, there will be obstacles. There are issues between us. Uh, also, Japan has a constitution that is a no-war kind of constitution. Japan has to do enormous uh, restructuring of its own uh, military and uh, reform its own uh, laws before this can really go forward. Also, Surya, as you mentioned, uh, you know, both the nations are grappling with the trajectory of China's rise and struggling to keep pace, in fact, with the geopolitical order that has thrown turmoil and doubts all over. Strengthening relationships here will be important, but China will be watching closely. Oh, absolutely. Uh, China has already indicated its displeasure over uh, uh, Japan uh, agreeing to um, get involved in the sale and transfer of uh, weapons and uh, military technologies. Although nothing much has uh, happened as of now, we are still in the negotiation stage. There are various areas we're looking at, including uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, robotics, uh, things like that. There's also some uh, talk that has been going on for some time over acquiring the uh, Japanese amphibious aircraft, the US-2. Um, it's an expensive aircraft. Uh, even the Japanese military has not bought many of them. But it has a lot of... Um, uh, the Navy sees potential for it in using it in the Andamans and other areas. So that will be some uh, negotiations on that. The issue, of course, is make in India. Are the Japanese willing to make in India? Absolutely. Uh, and that's really the question here. Absolutely, too. Surya, do stay with us. We're also being joined by a senior correspondent, Ramesh Ramachandran, who is in fact uh, right there on Ground Zero. Ramesh, and the, in fact, the ceremony has begun. Uh, various leaders are taking the stage to talk about the much-awaited uh, event to have taken place today. Uh, what more details are you gathering at this point? Well, at the moment, as we speak, uh, Railway Minister Piyush Goyal is addressing the ceremony there where the two leaders, Prime Ministers Abe and Modi, will participate jointly in the groundbreaking ceremony for the high-speed railway corridor project that will link this city, Ahmedabad, in Gujarat with Mumbai in the adjoining state of Maharashtra. Now, I want to take a moment or two to talk about the project itself. Now, this project, remember, Jessica, has been in the news for a long, long time now. Many commentators, many people have commented on the viability, feasibility, practicality and the need for having uh, such an infrastructure project, an expensive one at that, costing uh, several billions, thousands of billions of dollars. Uh, but the government of India, for its part, is hard selling the idea as an idea whose time has come. And uh, talking to a cross-section of officials who are uh, 
accompanying Prime Minister Modi to the ongoing visit here in Ahmedabad. Uh, I get a sense that uh, they are uh, citing three or four key takeaways or spin-offs from this railway infrastructure corridor project. Remember, Japan is already investing and supporting India in developing the freight corridor uh, passing through this region and also the Delhi-Mumbai, the in industrial corridor. So this is a third such project which Japan and the Japanese government is undertaking here in the western state of Gujarat. Now that said, uh, the government of India for its part is saying that this project will uh, spur economic growth in the region and beyond. It will also uh, generate at least 30,000 new jobs. It will aid uh, Prime Minister Modi's Make in India and Skill India programs. And also, uh, from the farming perspective, from the agriculturist perspective, they'll find it easier to move their agricultural produce from one state to another in almost double quick time. Remember, the 500-odd kilometer distance between Ahmedabad and Mumbai takes about six to seven hours today. But uh, when the bullet train uh, becomes a reality, hopefully by 15th of August 2022, uh, which is the first tentative deadline that the government is working towards uh, achieving, uh, 2022, by the way, will be the 75th anniversary of India's independence. By then, uh, you know, the, the railway infrastructure project would have had so many spin-offs that this debate of uh, how expensive it is going to be will prove, uh, will have, would have fallen by the wayside. Right, Ramesh, an important question here is addressing elephant, the elephant in the room. Would Prime Minister Modi, in fact, be able to convince uh, uh, his Japanese counterpart, uh, Shinzo Abe, to rather invest in his ambitious Make in India project? Your thoughts on that? Well, clearly, uh, Make in India, Skill India, Digital India, all the flagship programs of uh, Prime Minister Modi's government will be up for discussion and up for grabs, essentially, by the Japanese companies, Japanese investors, whom India wants to invest more in, in India, especially outside of the city of Gujarat. Remember, many Japanese companies are already invested heavily in Gujarat, in uh, automobile sector, in other sectors of the Indian economy. But the government of India wants it to diversify investments to other parts of India, especially the northeast, for instance. Remember, the northeastern states are landlocked and uh, there is uh, a lot of collaboration, cooperation happening between India and Japan on developing infrastructure in those landlocked northeastern states. So that is one key area which India and Japan will be discussing uh, going forward. But that said, the primary reason for the Japanese uh, interest in India is, is twofold. One is the bilateral component of the, of the relationship, and the other is the regional and global context in which these two countries survive and thrive going forward. Remember, India and Japan share many commonalities, uh, complementarities, and convergences on the issue of regional security. And uh, to my mind, any, any analysis or reading of the India-Japan relationship will be incomplete without talking about the proverbial elephant in the room, i.e. China. And it is interesting to note that uh, how India-China relationship have uh, taken a nosedive or plunged, as it were, in the last three years. Remember, President Xi visited Ahmedabad, this very city, in 2014. But since then, in the last three years, we've seen the, that relationship uh, plummet, whereas India-Japan is only looking bigger and better. So clearly, a lot of, uh, a lot of stake for both leaders as they progress through the remaining engagements uh, today here in Ahmedabad. All right, Ramesh, do stay with us. Let me take that question forward to Surya. You know, both the countries, in fact, will also strive to enhance their international cooperation in Asia and African countries, as is being, you know, said. With, in fact, sharp focus on international projects, given China's OBOR, the One Belt, One Road initiative, which India, in fact, has boycotted. Uh, do you think this friendship will further strengthen and uh, sort of look into their uh, particular rivalry, so to say, or uh, uh, enhance their relationship from here on? I think both uh, India and Japan are trying to offset uh, the, uh, trying to rebalance the Chinese uh, inroads, uh, strategic inroads they've made, uh, not just in their periphery, but also in Africa. Now, the Africa Growth Corridor is a project that has come up also in response to demands from African countries that the Chinese model of development, while it has, while it is efficient and it is, uh, uh, it has helped them in terms of building infrastructure, it has not really generated capacity or generated jobs. So the idea here is to use India's expertise in building capacity, which we've done in countries like Afghanistan, basically training people, giving scholarships, um, uh, providing the kind of basic infrastructure necessary for the country to build on. 
and Japan will provide uh, money, they'll provide the technological expertise. So it's an ideal combination to come together and uh, build these kind of uh, projects in Africa that help Africans not just make a profit out of them. Right, and uh, of course, coming back to you, Ramesh, is, uh, in fact, Surya pointed out that they'll also be looking to expand infrastructure deals with Africa. Uh, what sort of uh, bilateral talks can we expect on that at some certain announcement? Well, Jessica, India-Japan relationship, when we look at it in totality, not only is it important in terms of bilateral dynamic, but also in the regional and global context. And India-Japan collaboration in third countries, as Surya was mentioning there in Africa, for instance, in Afghanistan, in Iran, and, and other countries around the world in South Asia and Southeast Asia becomes that much more important. Now, as you mentioned, the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor can be seen as a rival to China's Belt and Road Initiative. But uh, that said, China's... Uh, foray or outreach into the African continent can be seen, has many critics for that matter. Uh, the, as the saying goes, China gives the African people, for instance, commodities or fish, as it is called in as an analogy, whereas India teaches the African people how to fish so that they can have a sus more sustainable livelihood and lifestyle going forward. Whereas China can simply buy its or spend its way around in around the world, including in Africa. Whereas India and Japan have a slightly nuanced take on uh, cooperation with African countries. And that, to my mind, is a more sustainable and more reasonable way of cooperation than the Chinese model of cooper cooperating with their African and Asian neighbors. Also, Ramesh, there are talks that both uh, Prime Minister Modi and Shinzo Abe are expected to deliberate on cooperation in the nuclear energy sector as well. Give us a little bit more, give us a little more details about that. Indeed, uh, in, in the, under the rubric of uh, defense and security cooperation, one can expect both leaders to discuss the civil and nuclear energy cooperation between India and Japan. Remember, India and Japan agreed on a civil nuclear cooperation agreement a couple of years ago. And uh, this month, this, this year in July, the Japanese parliament officially endorsed and approved the cooperation. So one can expect some forward movement of uh, some kind going forward on the issue of bilateral cooperation in civil nuclear energy. And that said, Japan is also important for India, Jessica, because Japan has mastered or perfected the system or the science of uh, reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel, especially under the closed fuel system, which India is now incorporating under the India-US civil nuclear deal. And uh, the Rakosho reprocessing plant in Japan is seen by many here in India as a template for India to copy and to replicate in all the nuclear power plants that India will be setting up in the years ahead. That said, many Japanese conglomerates, be it Hitachi, Toshiba or Mitsubishi are all interested in grabbing a share of the nuclear pie, as it were, in India. And many of them are partnering or in association with American companies such as GE and uh, Westinghouse. Uh, Westinghouse, for instance, has been in the news for wrong reasons because of bankruptcy allegations. Uh, but that said, uh, one can expect uh, Japanese companies to also show that much more interest now that the Japanese parliament has officially approved the cooperation with India. So both leaders can be expected to talk about the civil nuclear cooperation as well. And one can see some forward movement on this count in the months ahead. And uh, Surya, do you see there will be forward movement when it comes to investing in India further, given that, uh, I mean, there are certain speculations that the bureaucracy, both in the countries, are a little slow. Do you think, do you think that this will be facilitated easily and uh, we will see more uh, sort of, uh, you know, strategic and other infrastructure partnerships in the future with Japan? Jessica, the point is there are more than a thousand Japanese companies currently operating in India in diverse areas. So I'm not so sure about the um, criticism that uh, bureaucracy is an obstacle. Yes, uh, there may be issues in terms of land acquisition and so on, which are peculiar to India and which will have to be uh, got over. But the very fact that we have so many Japanese companies in India suggests that where there is a will, there is a way. Now, going forward, there are many more areas where the Japanese companies can step in, notably in defense. The government is pushing Make in India in defense. Uh, some Japanese companies like Mitsubishi are interested, but uh, when it comes to, say, uh, building in India or making in India or transferring technologies to India, I think there's still some way to go forward there. Uh, discussions are ongoing. We are not sure exactly uh, what the um, uh, current um, 
uh, nature of those uh, discussions are. But I would presume both prime ministers at their level will push it forward. Right, and uh, Surya, you know, China's power play, coming back to that particular question, China's power play is of course a huge factor, but do you, do you think that it's not the only issue that is driving India and Japan's uh, bonhomme right now? No, I think there are synergies between middle powers like Japan and India. We are uh, both in the same, uh, roughly in the same strategic space. Uh, we have uh, uh, strong economies behind us. India is developing and growing forward. Japan has strong technological base. They have a strong military base. And uh, in that sense, they, have, uh, they are looking for markets. In that sense, you have these synergies pushing uh, India and Japan together. You also have other countries in the periphery, South Korea, for example. Uh, we are now looking at uh, bringing that country too into the uh, uh, India-Japan uh, ambit. Uh, there are reservations, obviously, in South Korea, given the fact that, uh, given the history of uh, colonial exploitation with Japan, but those are issues that can be, um, that can be dealt with. These are not uh, insurmountable. Uh, yes, these are middle powers, and uh, there's a immense potential going forward together. Um, the Abe visit in that sense uh, lays uh, the ground for another uh, step forward. Absolutely, Surya. Just stay with us. And we also have, in fact, Ramesh with us live from Ahmedabad. Ramesh, in terms of a personal bond between Prime Minister Modi and Shinzo Abe, their leadership style, their synergy in domestic compulsions or their commodity or national interest, taking their strategic and uh, their financial partnerships forward, what more can be expected out of this uh, uh, particular visit? Well, uh, clearly, Jessica, to begin with, both leaders, Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi, are conservative politicians. So that should help, uh, you know, break the monotony and to keep the dialogue going between uh, Prime Ministers Abe and Modi. But that said, we've seen Prime Minister Modi invest his time, energy and effort into trying to establish a personal rapport with world leaders, be it Obama or uh, in, in the early administration in the U.S. or Trump now in Washington uh, or the other leaders around the world, including uh, in leaders from Europe and elsewhere. So clearly, uh, one can also see the bonomi, the, the warmth in the relationship, the personal chemistry, as it were, between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Abe. Remember, yesterday, Prime Minister Modi himself uh, broke protocol to receive personally received Prime Minister Abe soon after his aircraft landed here at Ahmedabad and one could see the both leaders engage in a warm bear hug and uh, hugs are much in news these days especially given uh, Prime Minister Modi's penchant for having you know these hugs much acclaimed and much talked about hugs with world leaders including President Trump uh, most recently in Washington. So clearly, uh, there is a lot of uh, chemistry going on between Prime Ministers Abe and Modi. The challenge essentially from both countries' perspective is to translate that uh, warmth in relationship into actual progress on the ground, be it in terms of trade investments, in security, defense cooperation, and especially in terms of the regional security architecture that concerns both India and Japan. Remember, India and Japan do not have any bilateral outstanding disputes, unlike India and Japan have with China. So that said, that should tell you something about the dynamic in the relationship between India and among India, China and Japan. And that, to my mind, that uh, China, Chinese are already watching this visit very closely. And one can already read commentaries in the Chinese official media, including in the Global Times, which has uh, tried to you know, uh, sidestep the issue of India-Japan collaboration and, and speaking essentially in nationalistic terms, uh, uh, essentially saying that India-Japan do not pose a threat to China. But the fact remains that India and China, there are so many com complementarities, commonalities, convergence, that it's only natural that India and Japan collaborate to ensure a regional peace and security architecture in the wider Indo-Pacific region where both countries are heavily invested in.